Let's now talk about some properties of the root locus. And the reason we want to do that is because in the previous video, our brute force wasn't too bad, but that's only because we had a relatively simple second order system. So how are we going to deal with our system if it's a much higher order? And so what we're going to do here is sort of lay some groundwork for some method where we don't have to factor the denominator of the closed loop system. So here we're going to lay our groundwork for some new method that doesn't require us to find our closed loop system. Doesn't require our closed loop transfer function, I should say. Okay, so let's consider just a general system. So here we have some general system and we see we have some input R of S, some output C of S, and then we have our actuating signal E sub A. And just to be really specific, let's go ahead and add some more terminology here. So this block with our K G of S, we're gonna call this our forward transfer function. And so we have that gain to include some general gain K. Sometimes you'll see the K in a separate block as well. And then down here with our H, this is going to be our feedback transfer function. And so as you can see, we also have negative feedback in this case. And so we can see that from our sum injunction over here. As I mentioned earlier, we're gonna consider the case of positive feedback a little later on, but for now we're just going to consider our negative feedback. So as we've seen before, what we can do is we can use our feedback form. So when we're talking about reduction of systems and we can reduce this to a single block. And so we can say that this single block is going to be K times G of S in the numerator divided by one plus K G of S times H of S in the denominator. And so again, we just have our R of S coming in from the left and our C of S coming out from the right. And so to sort of keep up with our terminology here, this is going to be our closed loop transfer function of the system. And so what we said is we don't necessarily wanna to have to find this each time. We want to have some method where we can just consider our system with our G and our H, and we can get our necessary information from that. So this is our closed loop transfer function. And again, oftentimes we'll, we'll write that as T of S. So let's go ahead and take a look at that T of S function. So let me actually just copy it from here so I don't have to write it again. So let's copy that, put that there. And so this is our T of S, which is equal to this. And I'm gonna label these equations because I'm gonna reference some of them a little later in the notes. And so just to be consistent with the notes, let's call this equation one for our closed loop transfer function T of S. So let's recall our definition of a pole. So definition of a pole of T of S is going to be a value of S, let's see if I can write so it's somewhat legible, value of S such that, or let's just say that makes our T of S, uh, the denominator zero, the function infinite. So that makes the denominator of our T of S equal to zero. And so that's a poor way to say that. So T of S, the denominator of T of S is zero. So our T of S becomes infinite. And so another way we could write that then is we could just sort of hone in on that denominator term and we could say, well, what we're really interested in is this one plus K G of S times H of S equal to zero. And so again, sort of with our terminology, let me put this in blue so it's more clear, but this K G of S H of S is what we're going to call our open loop transfer function. So a lot of terminology in this video, um, but it's important to keep straight what is what. So we can of course rearrange this and we can say that our K G of S times H of S is equal to negative one. And so let's for a minute consider what our negative one looks like in the S plane. So in our complex plane, so we have our imaginary axis J omega and our real axis sigma. And if we have a negative one, 
then we're gonna be at some point over here. So we're just going to have something that looks like that. And so if we think about what this is in terms of our magnitude and our angle representation, we're gonna have a magnitude of one and an angle from our real axis of 180 degrees. So we can say that this negative one can also be represented as one angle 180. And so really that angle doesn't have to be 180, it could be any odd multiple of 180. So we can then rewrite this again and sort of split this equation into two parts. And so again, to be consistent with the notes, I'm gonna call that equation two. So considering that polar form then, we can say the magnitude from, from that equation two expression, so the magnitude of k g of s h of s is equal to one, and so we get that from this term here. And so from there then, we can say that our gain is equal to one divided by g of s, so magnitude of g of s times magnitude of h of s. And so I'm gonna call this our equation three. And now we wanna address that other part of the, the expression there, our angle data. And so we can say that our angle of k g of s h of s needs to be equal to some odd multiple of 180. So to generalize, we can say two. And so let me actually switch this to a different count variable. Um, let's say two m plus one times 180 degrees, where m is equal to zero plus or minus one plus or minus two, so on and so forth. And again, with that piece of information, we're addressing this angular data here. So let's circle or box that. And so I'm gonna call this equation four. And so again, what we're doing is just setting an odd multiple of 180. It doesn't necessarily have to be at 180. So as it turns out, if equations three and four are satisfied for a particular gain at a particular point, then that point is part of the root locus. So if three and four are satisfied for a particular gain and at a given point, then the point is on the root locus. And so as you can imagine, we don't necessarily wanna be going through every possible point in the complex plane and evaluating equations three and four. So in a later video, we're gonna come up with sort of some general rules on how we can sketch it. And from there, we can sort of refine our plot. And remember, ultimately what we're working towards is being able to do this in MATLAB.